Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Empowering Musicians podcast. I am your host, Michael Manley, and the founder of Empowering Musicians. And today I'm doing a solo show after being in Chicago for a few days. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But I wanted to just reflect on what it uh, means uh, when I when I wanted to create this um empowering musicians initiative, right? So what do I mean by empowering musicians? So uh, for me, it's really two areas. One is all of the off instrument skills and knowledge and mindset that you need for a healthy career uh, for really all performing artists. That's really my focus. And the second is more on uh, brass pedagogy for beginners, returners, recovery. So, um, you may uh, have seen the banner for this week's show, which is all about really what it means to have a healthy career. So that's kind of the, the first part of this, right? The off instrument skills and knowledge that we need to build healthy and successful careers. Um, and I've been po focused on that mainly in this podcast because the audience for me talking about um, horn technique or uh, brass learning or um, my latest mouthpiece seems to be very limited. So I wanted to really restrict this podcast more to that first initiative. I did, however, in Chicago, get this awesome new Ian Balu one mouthpiece, which came in this awesome box. I just wanted to show it to you today. And I just think the packaging is so cool. And there it is. Um, wonderful silver mouthpiece. Um, so for those of you who are horn nerds, you just got your little um, horn nerd moment there. So um, anyway, uh, I did have an opportunity to kind of bridge these, these two initiatives, right? These two fields of off instrument learning to build a healthy career and horn specific uh, stuff. And it was um, during the pandemic and um, it was for the International Horn Society, which is as its name suggests, an international group of uh, passionate French horn players and um, of every level, professional down to amateur. So um, the International Horn Society workshop that year was being hosted by my wonderful friend and colleague, Lydia Vandriel up in the University of Oregon where she is the professor of horn. So um, I think when the proposals came out, I wasn't sure if we were gonna have an in-person live conference or a virtual conference, but um, her theme was the healthy horn. And I was thinking to myself, well, there's gonna be talk of, uh, you know, a lot of body mapping stuff, maybe some Alexander technique. Um, maybe there's gonna be other talks about physical health and the horn, mental health and the horn, very, very important. Um, and I thought to myself, well, what if I focused on what it means to have a healthy career, um, which is all of that off instrument skill, knowledge, um, mindset that one would need to have a healthy career. So I pitched that idea and I was very happy that the International Horn Society um, planners and board members and host Lydia uh, all embraced it. And so I gave this uh, hour long seminar, which ended up being a virtual seminar which tested my abilities to film myself and make a video, which I'm not technically savvy at all. So that was a, a challenge, but I, it really forced me to kind of um, put down a lot of these thoughts on paper and um, sort of hone what I'm trying to build into a curriculum now for this. Um, so uh, as far as I know, this curriculum doesn't exist. And if you are a teacher, if you are uh, somebody who's in college and you found this, please uh, direct message me, let me know. Um, I would love to, to get some examples of where this is happening. But um, the idea is really, what does it mean to be a successful performing arts worker? Um, and what skills do we need that don't involve that specific art form? So the model that I grew up with and that I, I think is probably more prevalent than I would, I would hope is that um, I went to college and I focused 100%, 95% on uh, 
practicing my instrument, right? Performing opportunities, very, very important. And I went to a really uh, wonderful school, the Florida State University School of Music, which did the most important thing uh, for their undergraduates that any school can do for performing artists, which is provide them lots of performance opportunity. Um, so I, I, I was doing half recitals as a freshman and a sophomore. I was playing in wind quintets. I was playing in orchestras. I was playing in wind orchestras. Great experience. And um, I think a lot of us do that. And we think, okay, well, all I need to do is master this skill and get as good as I can get. And then a career will magically happen, right? Um, I'll win an audition. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just get discovered and, um, all I need to focus on is being artistically, um, you know, great. Um, and it just doesn't really work that way, um, in terms of building out and designing a career. And so when I think about, you know, the lessons that I teach, I'm mostly teaching middle school and high school students. So we don't get to that phase, right? But when you're in college, when you get to that college professor, um, I believe that conversation really should be taking place from the freshman year on. What, what kind of career do you want to design? Where do you see yourself? Um, and then being really honest about some of those conversations and intentional about how to build that out, right? So for me, um, it focuses on four different areas. This is how I sort of framed it in my IHS talk. Um, I looked at preparation. Um, human dynamics, value and worth, and then nuts and bolts. So those are the areas that I'm, I'm kind of building out in, in different layers. Um, and the preparation is really the time when uh, we're studying, right? Um, but even as a young professional, we could also still study, right? We're always constantly learning. So um, I talk about, in that talk, I talked about the telescope and the microscope. So my approach was very uh, laser focused, very much a microscope, right? Um, narrowing down on one piece of, of information or in this case, one skill, right? Um, whereas I think a telescope, which looks more broadly at, um, at a horizon say, or, um, or something very far in the distance is a better, a better model. Um, and so what I mean by that is, um, I'll take, I'll take an example of like a bassoon, right? The bassoon is one of our, our great orchestral instruments. Um, bass clarinet's another, like there's a certain, uh, bass trombone's a really good example. Somebody just loves that instrument and they, their, their goal in life is to be an orchestral bassoon player, right? Um, well, if, if the number of first of full-time jobs that open up for bassoon players is, you know, eight, you're able to be counted on one hand per year, right? In orchestras, you might say to yourself, well, I may have to do something in addition to playing the bassoon, right? And how can I prepare, especially in my undergrad years? Um, that's where I really think this telescope model makes sense. Um, we can always go to grad school and practice for six hours a day <laughs> and focus in on that microscope um, approach to our playing. But really as an undergraduate, um, you have this opportunity to really explore and experiment with your uh, interests. And I think that's really key um, in building out an educational path toward a career. Um, I would also say that in addition to that, um, a lot of the opportunities now are for generalists and not specialists, right? Um, so we're seeing a lot of this in different types of opportunities for people. Um, you know, uh, playing in a chamber music group that not only requires that you play your instrument well, but maybe requires that you understand the basics of jazz and how to improvise and how to arrange, um, and maybe even how to compose music. Um, in the world of theater, I've talked about this before, we have a lot of actor musician roles that are coming up where musicians are uh, on stage, they have to have a physical presence, be in costume, act, and in some cases even have lines, right? Um, and in some cases play three or four instruments. So um, being that generalist, especially in our early years, um, makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that getting out of that laser focus early on also allows us to develop um, a healthy mindset about our, 
our instruments, right? So if, if I went into college, I'm putting myself back in time here, and I say, well, my goal is to be the best French horn player I can be, right? That's my mindset. I'm just, I'm just that. Um, there's nothing else I can fall back on if that path doesn't really work out for me or if, um, in my case, it looked like I may never play again, right, due to an injury. So um, I encouraged in this lecture uh, folks to do this exercise where we say, in addition to playing the violin, in addition to my passion for the French horn, I also love to, and then fill in the blank, like three or four blanks, just to remind ourselves that we're more than this instrument, right? If our mindset is too wrapped up in the instrument, um, it can lead to us really devaluing uh, what we do later on because we have nothing else to do if, if that's taken away from us, right? Um, if our only thing in life is that one skill and we're not really putting that in a context that's healthier of, but I also like to do this and I'm also this person, and I'm also this person, it can lead to a lot of problems later on. So um, the other thing that I did that I would never really encourage students to do these days is um, I changed my major very quickly from education to performance. And why I don't think that was a wise move on my part um, is that everybody that I know in the professional music world teaches, um, whether they are in a symphony orchestra and they have secure employment um, playing, you know, full time. They're, they're, they're teaching at colleges, conservatories, they're having private students. Um, and so that education um, is something that's going to be, be coming up for everybody. Um, I have so many friends who, like me, were performance majors and then went into education later on in life. And um, again, in these undergraduate years, we can say to ourselves, you know what, I'm only X number of years old. I'm going to have four years where I'm going to really explore all of these different areas of my interest um, and develop them. And then I can take two years and go practice in a practice room for and, and focus really on, on that if I want to. And then and then spend another two years um, taking auditions or, or um, pursuing that performance uh, focused career. But I will have done the work so that I'm prepared um, if if I do or if I don't land that job, because even if I do, everybody teaches, right? Everybody has to be an advocate. They all have to champion the arts. Um, even folks who, again, land these great jobs early on and have security as performers, they're going to have to meet with donors. They're going to have to meet with uh, patrons. They're going to have to make the case uh, and celebrate and champion the work they do with those who support it. So um, being that teaching artist, being that educator, very, very important to develop. Um, along with, as I said, these other skills. Um, and I think it's important to remember that um, one thing that I learned was that I'm a very creative person. And so my creativity expressed itself in writing. And so I love to write. Um, and my writing is not musical, weirdly enough, I write words. So I was really into writing, um, mostly my output has been plays. I've also written many, many articles. And I find that to be like a really um, enjoyable creative outlet. And um, oddly, performance is not terribly creative. I know this sounds shocking, right? But when you are a classical dancer, when you are a classical musician, um, when you are practicing an art form and delivering a performance, right? You're interpreting the work of a composer. You're interpreting the work of someone else. And there is an amount, amount of creativity to that, but there's also hours and hours of skill honing, much like an athlete. So for me, uh, classical musicians have much more in common with professional athletes, right? Um, and some of them discover like, actually like, you know what, I just don't know if I want to sit in the practice room and work on the first page of Don Juan for another three hours. Like 
I, I really want to go paint or I want to go write. Some of them become composers, right? And so you're not going to learn any of that. And conducting, conducting is a little bit more creative, I would say, it's and maybe a lot more creative than, than performing, right? Because uh, the conductor gets to determine, you know, all of these creative decisions around uh, interpretation and around uh, how we're going to deliver a, a piece, right? So the conductor in a, in a classical orchestra, right, or in a ballet orchestra or an opera orchestra is really the interpreter. And he or she is the main creative um, interpreter of that. I would say the same as the true of a director of a film or a play, right, or a choreographer. Um, and the performer, when you drill down to the performance level, our job is really to deliver those um, interpretations, deliver the work of Beethoven through the eyes of um, he or she who's on the podium, right? And, and much of our work is in that, for me, not only skill building, but skill honing, right? And over time, because I was never one of those musicians who could like put my horn away <laughs> for three months and then just come back and have everything. Like I had to work every day to maintain. I have to play scales. I have to work on my tonguing every day. My tongue will get like, I have really bad single tongue. If I don't practice it, if I, I have really bad lip trill, if I don't practice my lip trills all the time, um, it's not like you go through college and you're like, okay, got this, know how to do it. <laughs> you, you're always honing that skill. And that's not terribly creative work, right? It's very, very um, uh, athletic in a way, right? Because we're really just trying to get these incredibly um, specific muscle movements and coordination into our bodies, much like an athlete does, right? In order to deliver whatever um, sport that they're, that they're performing. Um, so when you're an undergraduate, and this is what I would advise all folks going into college is like really develop and figure out where your, um, where your heart is, right? And if it's in creativity, you might, you might decide that you're, a better composer or you're you're more drawn to that you may decide that you love the violin but your real passion is for conducting right for me my passion was more for chamber music i felt like that was uh the the wheelhouse that i did really well in i loved the idea of collaborating with a small group of people and having that control without a conductor right the other thing i love was opera just because it was this marriage of of both theater and music and the music was glorious. And um, I loved uh, I loved Broadway work. I love hearing the audience's real time reaction to art, and um, and seeing how they engage with it. So, um, but that's why it's really important in these undergraduate years to not spend all of your time in the practice room and to really look at what are the other areas that I might want to explore, um, and where am I on that creativity scale. There's a lot of musicians who have no interest <laughs> in composing. I, I myself find composing intimidating. I'm not that into it, but writing writing words for some reason I'm into. Um, I have a lot of friends who are composers and they really love it. Some musicians don't have that interest and they really do want to work on um, the performance aspect and that's fine, right? Um, but you have to know yourself and you have to know what you, um, where your skills and where your passion is. Um, the next thing that we talked about was human dynamics. And I sum this up as um, who you are is as important or more important than what you do. So people care more about who you are than how you perform. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can perform badly, right? It doesn't mean that you can have a career and not have done your homework and the work to really perfect as, as much as close to that that bar, that impossible bar of perfection, right? And as, as, as much as you can hone your skills as possible, that's totally necessary. But I've seen really, really fine performers that kind of sabotage themselves because they were terrible colleagues, right? Um, and so those human dynamics are really important. And being a good colleague is, again, as important as being a good musician um, or a good dancer or a good actor. Um, and the next thing we talked about was value and worth. And I'm not gonna go into it in this episode, um, but 
if you go back into my YouTube channel, um, I'm also on Spotify and Audible, and you look for the um, episode that is called Gigomatic. I I really created this formula which weighed a couple different factors. One was how valuable an experience was for an artist. The other was how much they were being valued for that through payment, right, or compensation. And then the last thing was uh, what somebody else was profiting from that. And then you, you make this formula out of all those things and you say, okay, well, this is healthy or this is not healthy for me, right? So um, if somebody asked, I use this as an, as an example in that episode, but if somebody asked me to play the Brahms trio at their church on their recital um, and nobody was really making a dime on it, you know, but the church was willing to let us have the space and my friend was really needing to do this recital for their degree or whatever, I'd be all about it because I love the Brahms trio, right? Um, and nobody's making money, so I'm good. If somebody asked me to play for um, Andrea Bocelli and they wanted to pay me $75 and the tickets were $400, I'd be like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that because that, that, that's out of balance. So that, that formula is explained again in this episode called Gigomatic. And I love it. And it's a fun thing that I invented. And I've had a lot of good feedback on it. Um, then the last area that I was going to concentrate on, or I did concentrate on in this talk, was really the nuts and bolts and um, contracts, um, you know, uh, union versus non union employment, what all of these things mean, right? Um, and I, I just dealt with this. give you one example. And this is uh, from the world of theater, right? So um, colleagues who are on some touring Broadway shows, some of these are union, some are not union, right? And their contracts give the employer an unlimited amount of rehearsal time, right? For no extra pay or for very little extra pay. Um, really, terrible thing to agree to if and and I, I get it that some musicians feel that they don't have the negotiating power to get out of those things but again um learning what those uh intricacies are of like a contract even if, it, if it's the contract that you're negotiating yourself right um i'll agree to a a, a a fixed rate for rehearsals right and even if it's a low rate um but I'm going to get paid for all of my rehearsal hours versus saying, okay, well, for this amount of money, I'm just going to do rehearsals whenever, right? But again, this is an example of how musicians are often um, kind of exploited in the field. And um, I think the more we collectively understand how that happens and how to avoid it, the better off we all will be. Um, and so... I focus a lot on those nuts and bolts because what I find is that not a lot of people have thought about it or, or know it. Right. Um, and they, they don't know uh, who they're working for or who's going to pay them or if something happens, who they should go to. Um, I did another show on uh, a, a musician's bill of rights, right? Like, so what should you expect as a professional? And um, again, my definition of a professional is a working musician. So as soon as you are out there dancing, acting, playing music, and you're doing it for money, <laughs> you're now a working blank, right? And that changes things a bit. Um, I'm currently working very, very occasionally as a French hornist, right? I love to work. Um, I just, the phone will ring, the phone won't ring. Um, but I do play in a group that is mostly all volunteer and I do it for no pay, but I do it because the artistic um, value and the artistic output is incredibly high for being a mostly volunteer group. And the founder is somebody whose artistry I really believe in. Very hard to find conductors who I think are truly gifted and great, right? So wanting to support that and also helping to try to build the organization, which is very tiny from a budgetary standpoint, to an organization which can pay everybody, right, as a start. Um, and 
understanding also that that organization does some really amazing education work that I find valuable. So it's fine. Again, we have to, we have to just have a way of assessing. And that's what I find that's missing sometimes um, in young professionals is, uh, and students is like, well, when is it okay to do that? Right. Um, is it okay to make a hundred bucks if I'm doing a stadium concert with Lady Gaga? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Is it okay to play for free for my friend's composing recital? Yes, I think that's fine if, if nobody's making money, right? So you always have to look at like where the money is and is there money? And how does that, how does that really affect the equation? So um, the last thing I really wanna stress with uh, folks in this curriculum that I'm building out is that you have to constantly learn, right? We are constantly learning and developing as artists. The day somebody says as an artist, I know everything, um, I just think that's, that's not an artist who is going to be as interesting as the artist who says, you know what, I'm growing every day. I learn so much from teaching. I learn so much from teaching students. Um, and I'm always honing my teaching craft because of that. As I said, I just got this brand new mouthpiece. I've been playing on my Lawson mouthpiece for probably 20 years and I love it, but I'm like, maybe, maybe it's time for a change and maybe I can experiment and find something that works even better, right? And we always have to be open to that constant learning and constant change. Um, and uh, I was reminded of all of this uh, last week because I interviewed Barbara Jocelyn Curry, who um, was in a great interview. And I, I, I tried really hard not to ask specific nerdy questions about the Metropolitan Opera that would bore everybody. And I think I did a good job of staying away from those. But um, she, during the pandemic, started her own small business making a, a kind of a new pencil holder for brass instruments. And it doesn't sound all that impactful if you're not a brass player, but if you are, you understand how cool it is uh, to have a, a method where you don't scratch up your horn or have your pencil fly on the floor when you, when you, um, you know, uh, turn a page of music. And so we were talking mainly about, about her entrepreneurial work, but, you know, even she mentioned like my career is not the career that most of my students will have. Like, you know, uh, having the fortune to uh, win a very, very high profile full-time orchestral job at a young age, and then, you know, having that be the basis of your career. Um, but even, even Barbara and her Metropolitan Opera colleagues found during the pandemic that even that, which was in my mind, like the New York Yankees of, of musical work, right? Like, it's like, there's nothing more secure than that. The Metropolitan Opera is this amazing cultural institution uh, for, for musicians. And I imagine for singers, it's, it's like the Olympics. It's like winning a gold medal at the Olympics. It doesn't get any higher than that. And yet during the pandemic, th their security was gone, right? Temporarily. So um, I really think that even for those rare uh, artists who are fortunate enough to, to land something secure right away, even, even the secure work is not secure anymore, right? Uh, the pandemic has kind of taught us that. And um, I was, uh, you know, and, and, and it's still, we're still recovering, right? So performances are coming back and they're back, which is great. But I know, for example, the Metropolitan Opera is really struggling to um, fill their hall now because the pandemic um, created a change of behavior, right? And so getting audiences back to live theater, live live music um, is, is becoming a challenge. So um, I really think it's time for this career uh, uh, course to be developed and I'm really excited for it. And again, if you're aware of anything like this, I know that there's kind of music business courses out there, but I'm not sure they really focus on things like what's the best educational career path for me? What's the best, um, uh, you know, uh, how, how do I learn what a good mindset means? And what is my mission, right? And my mission has to be more than I want to be the best X. It has to be more than I want to be the best violinist, right? Um, I have to have a mission that goes beyond my instrument. It has to be something that I can do without my instrument. Um, and then these nuts and bolts, 
uh, talking about you know human dynamics. I don't think anybody's teaching this on, at the college level. And the reason I think it's not being taught is partly because um, we're asking really provocative questions, right? Like, um, should you major in performance, right? Or, or should you major in education? Should you major, should you double major, right? I, um, <laughs> I've been kicking myself, you know, mentally a little bit, right? Because I was um, super passionate about language and English. And I was in the English honors program is my, in, in my undergraduate years. And Florida State was ridiculously cheap for me at the time because I, was in, I had in-state residency. And this was many years ago when college wasn't outrageously expensive. So I could have gotten a double major in English and, and, um, and horn performance, but I just didn't have the mentors and the support system to say, you know what? That's a really great idea because you are in these undergraduate years, this is the time for you to branch out and broaden. You'll always come back to this French horn and it will be here, right? But that's that doesn't serve the kind of music school industrial complex or the conservatory industrial complex, right? They don't want students to think about those things. Um, so that's why I'm really excited to be building out this curriculum. And I'm likely going to probably do it as an online course. Um, and look for more on that soon. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to just, uh, in my closing minutes here, say that um, the group I referenced earlier, the Desert Winds, is doing a really fun and cool anime and video game score concert this coming February 4th here in Las Vegas, Nevada in Henderson. And look for more information from that in my Facebook feed or on Making Music Matter Foundation's Facebook group um, really hoping I get some friends from the community who are going to come in costume. That would be super cool. And uh, I want to just encourage you all to check out those other episodes, especially um, the Musician's Bill of Rights and the Gigamatic episode on my podcast. Um, I think I'm going to start reposting some of those because I can do that on my various groups. And if you haven't joined Empowering Musicians Facebook group, please think about joining that as well. And uh, until next time, I hope you all have a great week and I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.